Hi there, Dave Levine here. Thanks ever so much for joining me for episode number 41 of the Sports Stories podcast. This is the first episode of series five. And during the break, we've been ever so busy speaking to loads of potential guests and um, we're dead excited about what's coming up over the next uh, few weeks or so with guests ranging from professional players um, right the way through to administrators, coaches and people that have been involved in the sport uh, system for many, many years. Um, today, my special guest, uh, I'm delighted to say, is Ebony Usaro brown Now, Ebony, I'm so delighted to have on the show with me, given that she's recently had a new addition to her family. She's currently uh, retraining to get back into the Super League in netball and has also um, just completed a traineeship in becoming a solicitor. So clearly, Ebony is pretty, pretty busy at the moment. So I'm delighted to say that we've had a, a great opportunity to speak with her. Now, Ebony is in addition to many of the guests that we've had on the Sports Stories podcast, and I'm delighted to to receive the feedback and the difference we've been making by sharing the story. So uh, as the listeners, I'd just uh, like to echo and uh, reinforce that it's brilliant to hear the stories that you're telling and the impact and the entertainment that they're having. So uh, please keep in touch. But all it leaves me to say really now is a a very, very warm welcome to today's special guest. Uh, Please sit back. There'll be loads of gems, I'm sure, and some real great principles in leading a a kind of a real performance lifestyle and and also returning to the top level of your game. So uh, enjoy the uh, session today. Listen right the way through to the end. Please keep in touch with your feedback. And and as always, I'll be uh, posing a couple of good questions for you to consider. So I really hope you hopefully get you to think. So it leaves me uh, a great pleasure in just uh, introducing today's guest. A very, very warm welcome to Ebony Usaro Brown or Ebony Beckford Chambers, depending on where you're looking on which social media platform as she's just recently got married. So welcome, Ebony. No, Ebony, welcome to the Sports Stories podcast. Thanks ever so much for giving me some of your really busy time. I guess my first question is, um, before we get into a bit more about you, is how the heck are you doing, given you know, you've got a lot going on at the moment? <laughs> Well, firstly, thanks for having me. Um, no, it is, has been definitely a strange time, hasn't it, the last year? Um, but I've still got a smile on my face. I think taking the positives from each day, um, making sure I'm checking in with people and saying, how are you doing? And mm-hmm. just kind of hoping that there's a light at the end of the tunnel this summer. So yeah, hopefully they keep that positivity and we'll get through it. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, it's great to have some positivity uh, to sort of share today and, and in, you know, in the world at the moment. D- digging into your story a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm conscious, you know, you, you've got a new addition to the family quite recently, which I'm sure we'll touch on in, in a second. But, you know, you've also juggling your your working career, being a mum, uh, you're coming back to, s- to your sport. You know, before we get to some of that, do you want to just give us a bit of a background as to, you know, how you got into sport right through to, you know, we'll, we'll come to, you know, what, what does your your world look like right now? But stand- yeah, it- it's definitely been a, a, a journey in itself, but it probably all started when um, from primary school. My mum's a head teacher, so she always actively encouraged me to, especially from a young age, to ha- maintain my academic study, but also to be really involved in sport. In terms of the, the characteristics and the qualities that it would help me develop as an individual, um, she said those are kind of qualities that you will take you throughout your lifetime and to different work spheres, different areas. Um, so she, I remember from a young age doing like lacrosse, hockey, netball, gymnastics, anything and everything that to do with sport I got myself involved in. And um, not to say I was good at each and every one of those, but I definitely got in and gave it a go. Um, but netball for me was where I really found an early love, um, mostly because all my friends played. And again, that social element of team sport is something that um, I still love to this day, but it allowed me to kind of channel my competitive spirit. And obviously playing against different schools and t- playing in different competitions. Um, it, was, it was fun. It was exciting. Um, and we were quite successful at an early age. So that always makes it kind of um, a better kind of remit and sphere to kind of be within. So I remember when I was 12, my mum took me to see England play Australia at Wembley. Um, she knew I obviously loved netball. So she was like, you know what, let's go and see an international game. And then I remember walking into Wembley Arena and the noise um, in terms of the fans and the crowd and just being in that environment and seeing how electric the atmosphere was, um, singing God Save the Queen with the England team when they were standing on the line before they, like, the actual whistle, the first whistle went. And just the way they transitioned the ball from one end of the court to the other end of the court, like I was absolutely gripped. And I think I knew from that moment that I wanted to play for England, I wanted to wear the red dress. And that was actually gonna be one of my 
ambitions and one of my dreams. So I remember leaving from that England game in particular and going back to the school and wanting to do in a club. Um, and I was referred to like the Epsom Downs. And from the Epsom Downs, I was then put forward to like Surrey County Trials, um, a completely different system to what it is now in terms of the pathway to England. Um, but the county system was very much alive and thriving at that point in time. And I was really fortunate because it was at a county game um, at the end of 16 level where I was scouted for England. And um, I remember the scout coming over and saying, oh, I thought you played really well. We did lose to Greater Manchester at that point in time, but she invited me to a summer camp with England for junior England at, at that stage, it was called the under 17s. And I thought I'd won the World Cup, literally. <laughs> the, the happy dance on the whole way home on the car journey, like eating the tuna sandwiches at that point in time. And just like, literally, I was literally over the moon. But I remember going that summer to um, the training camp in um, Kent and walking in, there's about 400 girls there. And the sense of, I had such an overwhelming sense of like anxiety and trepidation and, but my mum just, I remember mum just saying to me, do you know what, just put your best foot forward and just see, to see how it goes. So the first day was all about the sports science test in terms of like the bleep test, the jump test, the throw test, all the tests under the sun that I probably hadn't necessarily completed before. And let's say, to be fair, um, I was terrible. Like I was <laughs> terrible. I wasn't conditioned at all. Um, and there's some of these girls who had obviously been through the system program before, I remember on the bleak test, I think I got like 7.3 and I think the highest score, 7.3 nowadays is like barely a jog, um, but I was exhausted. But some girls are getting like 12, 13 and re really, really obviously show showing their caliber. Um, and then the second day of the actual, the trial itself was all about playing, uh, where the selectors used to sit around the court and then obviously you'd be identified by a number or a pack from your skirt. And then um, you'd be played in like different combinations. And back then, what they used to do at the end of the day, you used to get two envelopes. And the letter inside the envelope would either say congratulations or commiserations. So needless to say, on this particular occasion, I opened my envelope with so much excitement, given that I'd had my England opportunity, and this was like the first stage, and it definitely said commiserations. <laughs> I hadn't quite made it right. <laughs> um, but even at that early stage, I think I, I remember feeling really, really disheartened and disappointed. But I remember going to the coach and even asking, and my mum said to me actually to go to the coach and ask them, okay, so didn't make the squad this time, what do you need to do in order to get into the team or to show a level of sign of improvement? Um, so they gave me a training programme that I had to take away. And that involved like doing three cardiovascular runs a week, some strength and conditioning based exercises, um, a nutrition programme. So it was less hamburgers and chips and more vegetables and protein in terms of, um, but also just also some technical points to go practice um, back at school and at club and at county level. And I talk about this because I think I committed to that programme for a year and I did it religiously. So, so I, mean, I guess a couple of words that come through that you've spoken about there, one was sort of the, the anxiety, one was competitiveness, one was disheartenment. And I'm just wondering how you've managed yourself or where did the drive and determination come from when you experienced all these things to take you through? Do you know, I think it actually came from my mother. Like she's one of my biggest role models. Right. Um, right. She, I was predominantly raised like a single parent family. Um, although my mum is one of seven. So in terms of my aunts, my grandmother, everyone had a hand in terms of like raising me. But I think in terms of her work ethic, her strength, her design determination, like my, my grandfather initially, well, I'm of Jamaican descent and he initially came over um, in the early, I think, 40s or 50s um, to England from Jamaica. And he was always in search of a better life um, for his family, for himself. And in terms of actually, he always pushed that education was key and, and, and knowledge was power. And the way in which we were going to better ourselves and build like not only wealth within the family, but generational wealth um, and would be in order to pursue that through education. So I think those sort of values and that kind of mindset that he instilled in his own daughters and sons is what my mum tried to instill in me for myself. So I think that that drive came from her in terms of, in one sense, a Beckford never fails. Um, and that sometimes I think you could probably say that can come with an immense pressure, sometimes as a child. But the way in which my mum always presented to me was in a fun way. So I described right at the beginning of, the, like, of explaining my journey that I love netball, even though it was competitive, I loved it because it was fun. So I was, there was double benefits in terms of 
yes, I was doing sport, but I was having fun, but I was also developing things that were, and characteristics and qualities that were, would stay with me for a lifetime. So it never felt like a chore. It just felt like an, an, the natural course for me in terms of what my mum wanted for me. And I love that word of fun because I think that's so um, such a key word nowadays in terms of performance as well and how they the two come together. You know, and, and many people that I've spoken to sort of you might seem that they detach the two, but actually you yeah. brought them together, haven't you? To say actually having funds really helps you here to actually keep you driving forward and determined. How did you keep fun in your mindset and how was that involved? Um, I think because I think the tasks every day were varied. Um, and I think when you build, even at such an early age, when you build, when you have rivalries, yeah. you kind of have that kind of, that want to and will to kind of like, I know, get one over the other team or actually find a way. And netball is very much a game where you've got three seconds which to make a decision. You have to find a way and you have to find a way quickly because the momentum of a game can shift. And I think I found fun in being the strategist in that, in that sense. Um, and I think, in one sense, if I, if I link it to my, my career off the court now as a solicitor, I think those early teachings is what has also aided me in terms of the actual career I'm, I'm currently in, because you have to strategize, you have to, again, find a way to obviously represent your client and do the best for them. But it's, I think those learnings that I've taken from the network court has definitely lent to not only my personal life, my working life as a solicitor, but also on the court. So having those early exposures to how to do it and problem so in, in that kind of forum has given me those early teachings as how to apply it and do it in other areas of my life. And you make a brilliant connection there which I was going to ask you about actually because I'm really curious about the, 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 the transferability of what you've learned and acquired in your sporting career through to business. You know how would you summarize them or what, what else would you say and, and did you know that actually your sport would really aid you in your you know in your solicitor's career or not or have you worked that out along the way um I think upon reflection when I when it's interesting I think after our Commonwealth Games win there was and even the World Cup um, of 2019 I definitely reflected over the last 15 years more so than ever right. um because it's probably been the only opportunity uh, even after a 15 year career in England where I've actually properly allowed to allowed myself to kind of slow down and kind of take stock mm. and what I'm, I think I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that I didn't know sport would be such a tool in terms of shaping my careers on and off the court and the lessons that I would have learned but I think upon reflection when I look back it definitely was the vehicle which has allowed me to succeed in different areas of my life as well um, I think the early the early teachings that I was describing about in terms of when I, even when I went to first went to England trials um, and I got that first opportunity because even in, I take so much learning from that experience because even when I went to, I didn't make the squad but I asked the coach initially well what did I have to do it allowed me to kind of practice goal setting right. having a goal short short term medium term and long term and in terms of something to aim for. And again, that's is that that's the exact same scenario. That's why that lesson is so important to me because it definitely has shaped each and every step of my career on and off the court in all the different spheres in terms of making sure I have a clear goal um, that I write down and I stick to so there's no excuses in terms of, okay, what am I aiming for? And it gives me clarity and purpose in terms of each day in terms of what choices and decisions I do make. I think even in the same breath, like sport has given me the ability to know that you have to have a level of self-belief and confidence. And I think, again, that's something that I've learned very from an early age in terms of, I tell myself every day I can do it. And sometimes, some days it's challenging, some, day, some days I don't feel like it, some days are really successful, but you, that kind of positive reaffirmation every single day that I can do it is something that, again, I've learned from netball. I've learned from that experience of being not being selected the first time, but working my butt off to make sure I got selected the second time and each and every time that I've made myself available for England. But also that self-belief in terms of when I'm trying to balance and juggle everything in terms of work life, mom life, um, England netball, team bath netball, um, media work, that again, self-belief in terms of I can do it. It's going to be hard, but I think within that space, there's a lot of growth, there's a lot of learning which I can take from it. But I would only, I think, my learnings from sport and and how that self-belief has developed has definitely 
again lent to all the different areas and with, without that experience within sport and team sport in particular um, I don't think I'd be as, as strong-minded and as strong in general. Pepperly, this might sound a bit of a strange question but how did you build that self-belief? Did it was it a, was it a, just a journey and something that's gr grown, or did you actually put things in place for you to to build that discipline and that self-belief and awareness as you've gone? I think it's grown because I'm naturally a very competitive person. I think if, if you, I think it's interesting because one of my teammates at Team Bath said to me the other day, Leila Guskov, it's almost like she's a doctor, and she said to me, "It's interesting. Off the court, I'm quite relaxed. I'm smiley." I'm so laid back, but if you watch me on the TV or if you, you play with me on court, I'm so intense, I'm so focused, I'm so driven. Right. It's, a, it's like two different personas. Right. But I think that's because I've always been a person, I don't wanna sit on the bench. If I've, ne if I've invested in, like lots of time in terms of developing my trade or putting in the hours and to prepare me for a certain competition, as my mum and I always used to say, you've gotta put your best foot forward so I'm gonna give myself the best opportunity. I think in terms of that self-belief, you I've had to develop that confidence because without that self-belief, I wouldn't push myself as hard. Um, and to know that I want to know when I get to the opportunity where I need to be selected or, or chosen, that I've done everything I could do to put myself in the best position to be selected. I think that self-belief in terms of I can do it and I will do it is what drives me every single day. So it's something that's definitely grown um and they, obviously there's been bumps in the road but I think I take I see it more as a every situation I put myself as a positive situation whether even if the outcome has been negative because there's still lots of learnings I've taken from it which has then fueled my experience or developed my experience moving forward so how you mentioned bumps in the road and I think you've sort of loosely touched on that but how 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 have you managed yourself through the bumps in the road because plenty of people listening to your story here would be going God, you, it just sounds like it's all perfect, but actually there's loads of, I'm sure there's loads of highs and lows. And I'm just conscious yeah. of how do you get yourself up when things are not going your way? There's definitely been bugs in my road. I remember when I was 17, I did my ACL Ooh. in terms of, um, that was my first major injury. And I remember, again, sitting in the doctors at that point in time, they were saying, you're gonna be out for six to nine months. Um, and I felt devastated because you're just like six to nine months. And it feels like an absolute lifetime as a elite athlete. Um, I've also dislocated my shoulder at, at different times. Um, and again, it is, it, is, it is a challenge. Like I think those, as an elite athlete, those are some things you always have to prepare yourself for. Um, very rarely does an elite athlete go through a whole career without having those types of setbacks. But again, I think it's just acknowledging like what the setback is. And like I said, I'm very much a goal set, like a goal setter. Mm -hmm. So I used to set myself like two weeks. I need to be, I don't know, getting my legs straight four weeks I need to be walking without crutches six weeks I needed to be um on on the bike but I think with by having those like small measurable targets yeah. is what helps me get through um very process driven in that sense yeah. so uh, but it also helps me keep accountable because if you set those sort of deadlines and like those measurable targets it almost feels like mini rewards mm -hmm. and I think by com compartmentalizing them in like small blocks so by the time I get to my final goal I kind of feel like it's you can it's re truly is a reward because you can kind of measure um and see the journey that you've been on um but for me also the the disappointments haven't necessarily always just come from injury I remember the Glasgow 2014 games mm -hmm. where we had the squad that was going to win gold or what we thought was going to win gold and I remember getting to the competition and we'd been on, a. I think 2013 was one of our best years in the netball. I think we'd won absolutely every single game that year. So we got to 2014 and I think we were the, I guess, an underdog favourites in one sense. Favourites in terms of we could take the title if we had a good day, but we're definitely the underdogs because we've never reached a Commonwealth Games final before. And I remember in the rounds, we were up against Australia by seven and we ended up losing the game by one. We then went on to the semi-final and we were up against um, New Zealand and we ended up losing the game by one. And I think it was, again, those, uh, we then played Jamaica, I think in the bronze playoff and we lost by five or six. And I think for me, that those disappointing moments, again, have what kind of fueled my kind of self-belief and passion in terms of, you can't get ahead, too far ahead of yourselves, but why it's also important to be process driven and have those short-term targets. So. 
If you ever ask me now in terms of why we were successful in 2018, it's more because we focused on winning every quarter than winning every game to put ourselves in a, in a position to obviously be in that final, obviously to eventually take the gold medal. But I still see that as a really positive thing because the learning, from, if I hadn't had that experience in which to learn, I don't, you don't necessarily have to lose in order to learn, but I do think that was a, definitely a turning point in terms of losing and having that disappointment, which then definitely fueled not only my success, um, but also, I guess, how I approach things off the court as well in terms of how I go about my business and the reason why I do it. Fantastic. And you, you articulated and painted a beautiful picture there about how, how you work, actually, and what really drives your performance. And Ebony, I'm, I'm wondering here, you know, do these principles uh, work for you? Do you call on them in your, um, in your professional career as a solicitor as well? How do you see your job falling out and, and you being successful in that role? Um, 100% I call on them. I, I, I go by five things, which I, I think I, which drives me every day, especially as a solicitor, because it's really interesting. I go from England netball, where I'm an elite athlete and considered, most often considered at the top of my game, as one of the best defenders in England, one of the, one, previously one of the best defenders in the world before I had my baby and I'm, I'm on maternity leave quite right now. But in the sense that, but then I go into the legal environment and I only just qualified, I'm a newly qualified solicitor. And the spectrum in terms of being, I guess, one of the most experienced, I would consider maybe experts at, at, at one thing, and then a very much a junior learning, learning and earning my stripes in a different environment is, there's such a contrast. But again, the learning from sport in terms of goal setting. Okay, so I'm a solicitor. What do I need to do? Where do I need to get to in terms of earning? Well, initially it was qualification when I was doing my training contract but also, okay, now becoming an associate, but also learning, I guess, I'm a commercial litigation solicitor in terms of actually learning that sphere in terms of um, gaining confidence, gaining experience of all the different aspects involved in being a commercial litigation solicitor. So again, so what's the goal? Again, two, drawing on support from my support network. Who do I need to communicate with? Who do I need to ask for help when necessary? Can I actually go and find the resource and material myself? Um, but also just not being afraid to having those conversations if I needed that support. I guess, again, this level of self-belief and confidence because without it, you have to believe, like I have to believe in the journey. I have to believe in terms of the advice I'm giving in order to best represent my client. I have to believe in terms of the strategies that I've now, that I've learned to develop is actually the correct one and go with my gut instinct. I have to, in one sense, I always say it's a phrase that's often thrown around by elite sports people about being comfortable, being uncomfortable as well. And that's something I've learned from sport, which I take into law because it is uncomfortable because I am in one sense, a junior lawyer learning and earning and applying my trade. But in that sphere as well, by being uncomfortable, I'm also growing and developing and learning every day, which is actually making me a better solicitor, a more confident solicitor and a more competent solicitor at that as well. Kind of touches um, on that competitive spirit in you as well, isn't it? And dr brings that energy into you, I guess, to, to yeah. thrive and strive here. Yeah. yeah, and I think as you're talking about the energy, that's the fun element. Right. Because I think in terms of law is a, is a mindful, it's a dynamic industry, and particularly commercial litigation, you have to be a strategy. You're trying to outwit and outsmart your point, uh, opponent. Um and also like driving the negotiate and get the best deal for your client as much as you can. So that competitive element is, and, and this particular area law is best suited to me because mm. of all the different things I've learned from sport. And that's what I find fun. And, and I think did, that- did you, did you know that before or did you, have you now worked that out, you know, subsequently since you've done your training? Because it, it's something about the matchup there is brilliant, isn't it? You know, and to help people work out, actually, there are some real connections there in terms of what suits you as a person. I knew I loved the commercial sphere. I did a commercial law master's after my law degree at uh, Bristol, and I knew I loved that sphere. I, also, I did my master's at a time, though, when it was the financial crisis. So there was lots to talk about. There was lots of like opinion to be had. There was lots of debate to be had. But it was only when I did my training contract that I did a seat in commercial litigation that I was like, this is for me. Um, it applied, obviously, the area of law that I really enjoyed, but it applied in a way that, again, it was different every day in terms of the challenges I was having to kind of navigate. Um, I think in terms of the legal issues I was having to kind of research, contend with, and 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 um, 
like research and like develop but um so it's something I didn't necessarily know but I, I came upon it came upon it and just just knew that that that, that was the space I wanted to be in. Ebony, you know, you've, you've given a great picture again about your uh, your sort of your netball world and your uh, your kind of your your solicitor world that you're you're developing and growing in. Um, and I'm, for me, that you've really painted a lovely picture about sort of two different identities or how you've kind of travelled through your career. Uh, I'm also really curious about the, the the fact that you know you you've just had a, a, a newborn, a new member to your family, and you've kind of, you're going again. And, you know, could you talk us through a little bit about how that's been for you to, to really come back in and get yourself to get up and start performing again? Because I'm sure, again, a lot of people will parallel with that um, aspect in their journeys. It's been a weird one, I'm not gonna lie, because when I found out I was pregnant, obviously you have all those range of emotions that you're absolutely mm -hmm. elated. It's this new, I got married in 2018, and we definitely talked about having a family. And after the Netball World Cup, it was it was definitely a consideration that that could be the time where we start thinking about it. So I found out I was pregnant in December, 2019. And obviously you have those range of emotions as I've talked about, but then when you're hit with a pandemic in March, 2020, and you go into lockdown, that definitely wasn't part of the plan. So <laughs> in terms of um, the usual things you probably engage with in terms of seeing family and friends that you'd be excited about the new pregnancy or a baby shower and all that, that kind of the razzmatazz that in and around your first pregnancy that comes with it. I probably didn't experience it. Yeah. I didn't experience it. But what it actually did allow me to do was in one sense, slow down. Right. Um, right. I'd been part of England between like 2018, for example, um, it was the Commonwealth Games. I captained Team Bath. Um, I planned a wedding and I was also completing my training contract. So, in, in you know what, I don't think do things by halves. So in terms of actually when 2020 hit and obviously my, I was pregnant, um, it's the first time in a very, very, very long time where I actually the focus is more just about my own personal yeah, and individual yeah. well-being to slow down and just focus on me and the baby and just kind of nurturing both of us um, in a really comfortable environment rather than I guess going from pillar to post um, but in in saying that I had a really enjoyable pregnancy and then having Savannah it was absolutely wonderful um, but I always knew that I wanted to return to netball at some point I think having had that time away and having that mental break um, it I knew I wasn't quite finished and I was just really fortunate that having I communicated this to like Team Bath they were very very supportive of my decision um they put they obviously in terms of support services they put in and around me in terms of strength and conditioning coach a pelvic floor health consultant um a nutrition plan um and obviously kept me involved in the club again it, it kind of i knew that i definitely wanted to come back regardless um of any obstacles that might like present itself along the way so the journey back after savannah um i i never knew about contractions or any of that in terms of <laughs> they talk about what was hard what's harder lactic acid or contractions no, no. I'm gonna say <laughs> gonna say contractions um um but the female body is absolutely amazing mm -hmm. and i'm still in awe in terms of obviously savannah herself and like what it what it's done but i'm not gonna lie i think for years in terms of elite athlete you keep your body in such like phenomenal shape in terms to execute the activities you you want to do at such a high level so you're really going back to basics after five I think I went back after five weeks after having Savannah but took it very very slowly in that sense but I think I was it, my body was all over the place like uh, nothing was connecting my core was absolutely terrible but um um it's it's but um, I knew I wanted to take it really slowly in terms of respecting the, the fact that it's taken me nine months to like obviously grow a baby it's definitely gonna take me some time to get back but that's why I started uh, documenting it on my Instagram okay um I did a journey back to the court in terms of oh, from day know. one to I think we're on day 163 right now um but just taking each each and every day in terms of like I said my my goal in one sense was to get back to the Super League which started in um yeah. end middle of February so that in one sense was my like like my medium term goal the long term goal is probably hopefully winning the super league at the end of the season right. but the short term goal was in terms of hitting those strength and conditioning markers and those cardiovascular markers at each stage 
to try and make myself available even for that first game. So, and I'm saying the journey, it hasn't been easy. It's been tough. And I think I've definitely shared the, the highs, the lows, um, the brilliant moments and the ugly moments on, on my Instagram for that very reason, just to show it is real. Yeah. But also to show in terms of the work that you have to put in in order just to get to certain levels and standards. And, and but I've enjoyed every moment. Again, it's that challenge. It's that fun. It's that having a purpose each and every single day as outside of being a mother that's allowed me to maintain, I guess, some of my old identity, even though I now have this new role and this new chapter in my life. And do you think your purpose and your role and your goals have changed or will change, given that, you know, you've got Savannah with you now, or do you think you're still as, as focused? You know, because a lot of people do talk about, you know, um, you know, having a new a newborn into the family and a new member sometimes does adapt and change them. And I'm just wondering whether that's um, actually added something different to you or not. It's definitely changed me yeah. um, in terms of what my priorities are. Right. Um, I consider myself really fortunate because I've been able to attend three Commonwealth Games. I've been able to attend three World Cups. I've won that elusive gold medal and I'm very fortunate to have now uh, the century, the golden century of representing my country. Yeah. And Savannah and her needs and, and my role as a mother is of the most, uh, most important to me. Um, obviously, obviously my different roles in terms of being a wife and a daughter and like I know a teammate and a solicitor, all those different ones. But I think being a mother has definitely changed my priorities like moving forward. Um, but it doesn't mean, although my priorities have changed, doesn't mean that my goals and my own ambitions right. have changed. It just means that they look a little different and we'll have to execute them in a different way with different considerations. But it doesn't necessarily mean I have to completely lose who I am and, and what I might want to do. Yeah. Um, just because I'm, I'm, I'm now a mother. And I think, but I think for me, it's also the fact that actually, like my mother was to me, I want to be the greatest role model to her. Yeah. So actually, she, when she grows up and she'd be like, okay, she had me, she took care of me, but she also did what she wanted to do. And I think that's a really important message to hopefully Savannah and that's to other you being a role model, isn't it? It's part of the role yeah, model you wanted children. to pick up. Yeah. that you don't necessarily have to lose yourself or give up sport just because you've become a mother, but you just need to find a way in which to kind of combine the two. Yeah. Well, you, you lead me on to a, a um, kind of a part of a quick fire few questions I'd like to, to push your way. And, and one of them would be, you know, um, what advice would you give to a, a younger version of yourself, given the story you've been on? Because, you know, you've got a, a new member of your family, but also, you know, many people will be listening to your story or maybe you've even followed it, obviously, on Instagram and so on. And think, gosh, I, I wonder how you do this and what advice you might give to a, a younger person setting out on their journey. Advice I'd probably give. Um, it's something that I learned and appreciate now as, I was as, I've, as I've, I've been talking to you in terms of how I've reflected. But I think if I could tell myself earlier yeah. that to see every day is an opportunity. Um, and really kind of believe that every day was an opportunity to make change or enjoy challenge, um, then I would probably tell my younger self at an earlier point to start believing in that. And I think that it's probably a really hard concept to, I guess, kind of, to kind of tell a young person. But I think what I said in the beginning, the fact that I now practice in terms of telling myself every day when I wake up, okay, I can do it, or setting out clearly as to what I'm going to do and why I'm going to do it. Um, I think helps me develop that mindset of seeing every day and every challenge as an opportunity. Um, but I don't think I have, yeah, I think probably seen that and, and also just enjoying the, pro like, the, like see everything as a process rather than just a quick fire um, or a quick route to achieving success. And Ebony, you know, your, your story for me, uh, and you've mentioned a couple of people on the way have really had an impact on, on your, your journey, you know, and I'm, I'm curious just to know, you know, are there any individuals that by name or not that have really impacted on you? And, and if so, what have they done through your journey that have been really pivotal to help you? Because again, I'm trying to do that, you're trying to do that, and many others are trying to inform and influence and impact on people's lives. And I'm just wondering what it was that or who it was that really has impacted on you and how? I've got three sets of people 
I think the first set, um, we talked about before about leaning on your support. Well, I've talked about leaning on my yeah. support network and my, my support network, it really involves probably three sets of people. And the first is probably my mother, my husband and my wider family, because I think they see the glory moments and the tears. Um, and they're always there with a the kind or constructive word. And I think without that emotional support, and especially how elite athletes tick, um, I don't think I, well, I wouldn't have achieved what I would have done. Um, I think the second group of people, I think would have to be the coaches and national governing body and two kind of coaches in particular stand out to me. Um, well, three coaches, well, Anna Sembridge and Jess Selby as when they were team bath coaches as a unit. Um, they kind of nurtured me from when I was an under, in an under 21 going to the World Youth Cup, Network World Youth Cup to today. So Anna's still my coach at Bath. And in terms of the level of support that she provided me in terms of allowing me to, give me the tools to kind of follow my dreams, but support me on and off the court in terms of what my academic ambitions were, or even my career ambitions were, and having that ability to have that relationship and rapport with the coach um, has been instrumental in my success. But similarly, in that coach, completely different style um, and completely different approach, but a great, she was excellent, was also Tracy Neville. Um, both, both Anna, Jess and Tracy, they, they're very different coaches in their own right. But I also think in terms of Tracy, who believed in me in terms of, I'm not a part of the England Netball full-time program, but she respected the fact that I obviously want to still work and do law, but knew that I could offer and like, contribute to the England team. Um, in like as as we had those like gold medal ambitions before the 2018 and 2019 world cup so i think for different reasons those, those coaches but also i guess the national governing bodies and like team bath network the actual organizations themselves i think when you're in a in a in a environments that have strong values uh strong vision but also have that level of belief in you as an athlete i think again has been really inspiring for me and you want to work for them and and contribute as effectively as you can because of the resource that they've put into you and also the kind of the commitment they've shown. Um, and I think the third group of people, I think has probably inspired my journey, um, is probably the athletes have, that have gone before me. So the Sonia McClaimers, the Jeeva mentors. Um, I actually saw, when I went, remember I said I was 12 when I went to Wembley and I saw England play, Jeeva mentors was actually playing in that <laughs> match. So the fact that I actually ended up winning a gold medal with her and she's now actually a teammate um, <laughs> is also a really special thing. Um, but the Amanda Newtons, um, the Casey Kapoors, those inspirational examples that I've been able to witness and either play alongside or been tutored by in one sense, or they've taken me under their wing, I think they've all been instrumental in terms of showing me the way, but also showing me the way so I can then show others, like the younger generations who come after me, who may not have been able to witness their greatness as to how it can be done, why it can be done and how being in this role is symbolic of, because it's representative of what, even as a, as a black woman, what young black girls, but even young girls, young boys in general can also achieve. Um, so I think those three, three different sets of groups have definitely been instrumental in terms of my, my level of success. Wow. It's, and so so many powerful messages and it, the one that really stands out for me is is again how you've articulated the idea of actually really accessing help and support and using your network uh, as a real performance enhancer along your journey and being seen that not as a um, as a vulnerability but actually as a strength to use the people around you but but conversely now at the stage that you are in your career as a netballer but you know, is actually how do I now pass that on and how do I pass that on as a parent? So it's really lovely to show that role of a role model, but at different stages, both in your playing career, but now how it's also similar, but different now in your um, in your solicitor's career, you know, in terms of now you're needing support. So that's brilliant. Now, I'm, I'm conscious that, you know, you, you've got a very busy lifestyle. So my very last question would just be, you know, you, you've been so lovely and open in sharing your journey. Whose sports story might you still be inspired by or interested in finding out a little bit more about? Because, again, you've used that very well in your story about really learning from others. And I'm wondering if there's anybody else you would still be keen to learn from or be inspired. I actually am keen to learn. I've Over the last what, year and a half, I've been really intrigued by Naomi Osaka. Yeah. Um, obviously, the tennis. Like Serena Williams is one of my, my biggest role models. Um, right. I love the way she goes about her work. 
and I feel like she's an ultimate champion. But obviously there's a new era burgeoning, especially in tennis. Mm -hmm. Obviously it's not a team sport, but I think in terms of how powerfully that Naomi has kind of used her voice um, mm -hmm. more recently, I find really intriguing. So I think in terms of like learning her story as to how, and she got to where she is, I'd be quite interested to, to mm -hmm. find yeah. that out. Wow. There you go. But well, well, Ebony, thank you for sh for sharing that. That's a, that's an amazing and it, and again, uh, just your your rationale as to why she's important. I think is really important for people to understand and, and to consider for themselves as to who who's their inspiration and who would they like to find out more about. And you know, you've shared part of your story. We we could go on for a, a, a huge amount of time, I'm sure, and, and share loads. If people are interested to find out a bit more, um, you know. Can they contact you through social media or find out a bit more? I guess there's your Instagram account. You know, what, what would be the details to find out a bit more about your journey and your story? Um, the best way to find out is mostly through Instagram, um, Ebony with Zero Brown. Um, but I'm also, I also, I'm also on Twitter, so Ebony B Chambers on Twitter. I haven't changed my married name on Twitter. So those are the best two ways. Or if you can, tune into Sky Sports as well, because the Super League's currently playing at the moment and every game is live. Um, so you can see you can follow my journey and, and occasionally I'm a pundit so you'll get to hear more about what I think in and around Brilliant. the netball spin. Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much. Um, I, I really appreciate you, the time you've given today and I, you know I'm really passionate about making a difference through sport for, for girls, boys, you know people that are just interested in it through work and through business and you know your story's really been scattered full of many inspirational messages and, and real loads of little tips there as well so once again thanks ever so much good luck um, with bringing up your little one uh, enjoy the journey and good luck with the super league and and developing on in the career and you know let's uh, be great to keep in touch and if i can help and support and sports stories can you know echo your story further down the line it would be lovely to have you back on at some stage but thanks ebony uh, and good luck with the rest of the season no worries thanks for having me now that was an incredible conversation there with Ebony. I'm absolutely blown away by not just what she said, but how she said it. The way she delivered her messages was absolutely amazing for me. The words that really come to my mind, however, were determination, focus, energy, all underpinned by incredible goal setting abilities. And I think it was just so clear in the way she described her journey and her story, uh, the values that she'd picked up through where uh, her grandfather and her mother and the environment that she's been brought up and some of the, uh, the challenges that she faced at an early age and how they really impacted on how she did what she did and not just what. It was an incredible story for me with many messages to take away. Now I want to pose a couple of questions to you therefore. How do you goal set? Given you've heard what Ebony said there and the detail and the intricacies and the determination and focus of her goal setting to not let her off the hook I would like to understand how do you goal set? Now the second question I'd like you to consider is if every situation provides an opportunity to learn as Ebony suggested, what have you learned about yourself and your surroundings in the last week or so to help you progress positively? Now one of the things you could do is to really consider about what the role sport has played within your life as well and I would like you to consider that on top. I know it's a general broad question but for me Ebony really emphasised the, uh, the learnings that she took from the sporting context and the sporting environment into every part of her life, whether, whether it was at home or whether it was in her career as a solicitor. And I just love the idea that we can actually learn whether you're involved in sport at a high level, as an administrator, uh, whether you play recreationally, whether you're a coach at a junior level, whatever your role is, there are some real key principles which we can take. So I'd like you to consider that. So there we have two great questions. Consider the questions, reflect and take action. Please send in your comments. It's always great to hear from you. Hearing your feedback and the stories and the impact that it's had on you is absolutely fantastic. And it's for you is why we deliver the podcasts to really help you on your journey to make a difference in your life. And if wanting to maximize your impact in whatever you do and how you do it, then this is the place for you. So, as I said, if, if maximising your impact is what you're after, please take a look at the Sports Stories website. It's at www.sportsstories247.com. There's further information there about the Academy um, and also the previous podcast guests and also the coaching and mentoring offer that we provide, which again is 
uh, resourced by myself and many other of my colleagues who are uh, grounded in some principles around sport and performance sport and in people development. So uh, that's the place to look if you're interested. Also, please follow me on social media, uh, on Twitter, LinkedIn, on those sort of channels. We're still there uh, providing bits of information, but also I'll provide updates on new releases in terms of podcast guests and uh, also you know, resources coming available to you. Now, in terms of new podcast guests, um, tune in for next week's guest. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting one. Uh, the sneak preview would be that I'm speaking to a gentleman who is one of the tallest gentlemen in his sport. I'll, I'll say no more there, but he's got a really interesting and powerful story, again, with many messages for how you can live a much more purposeful, impactful life, whether you're a coach, a leader, a parent or a teacher. So it, oh, it'll be a really good one. Uh, and that just leaves me to say a, a, a massive thanks for you for listening in. And as I mentioned, you know, we're doing the podcast for you, the listeners, to help you on your journey to hopefully educate a little bit, but crucially to offer some inspiration and, and offer avenues for sort of transformation and behavior change so we can really make a greater impact in what you do. And I'd also really like to just end off on thanking Ebony for, for kicking us off with a great episode for the start of series five uh, with plenty more to come, but she's set the standard really high, which is, is absolutely fundamental and, and really good for us keeping improving on what we do. And as Ebony said, put your best foot forward and make make the most of the opportunities that come your way and what we're doing at uh, Sports Stories is absolutely doing that is trying to put our best foot forward uh, maximizing opportunities and trying to really galvanize the opportunities that you have for for you as well so thanks for joining me today really appreciate it uh, and I look forward for you joining me Dave Levine again next week for another great uh, Sports Stories guest until then take care and we'll see you again soon